very good evening to all warm greetings welcome all to another session of friday waters thesis club the friday water series is an extension of flagship program wednesday for water of the w4w foundation the idea of friday waters is to wet the fridays with fun filled and yet fruitful activities for the future generation friday water series has water talkies book reading thesis club water arts and meet a maestro some of them taking place once in a month the focus of the thesis club is on bringing students and scholars who have done or are doing research on some aspects of water matters to the session in order to discuss with them their identified problem aim objectives methodology research design field work findings and learning in the process know about the making of the research and the contribution it aims to make in science and society the session is also meant to increase the outreach outreach of the research and the researcher my name is ekta gupta and i am the moderator for today's thesis club session i am joined by dr mansi bal bhagav the founder director w4w foundation as a discussant for today's session today our speaker is neha mungekar and i request dr mansi to introduce our today's speaker over to you mansi thank you thank you so much ekta usually you are doing the introduction of the speaker but i wish to take this honor for today because it is also the 300 session of w4w foundation and at the same time uh, neha is a junior to me in the masters as well as phd so i thought i i must take this honor to invite neha for today's thesis club session so first of all thank you neha for giving us time and also taking out uh, this uh, you know uh, in, in very uh, important time of your research because i know you are also some going to submit your phd research in few weeks time so neha mungekar is an advisor and researcher at the dutch research institute for transitions drift based in rotterdam the netherlands and specifically erasmus university so i feel proud that uh, i'm alumna of the same university um, currently she is engaged in the indo dutch water for change program investigating how to nurture governance capacities for transitioning to water sensitive cities in india her professional background encompasses significant significant roles as water governance expert urban designer and environmental photojournalist neha's academic and practice interests are centered on exploring the power dynamics associated with the distribution and allocation of water resources with a particular emphasis on transformative governance in the global south her work integrates complex systems thinking and anthropological approaches to provide nuanced insights into the water governance and its implication for diverse stakeholders she expert, her expertise lies in facilitation knowledge brokering and consensus building through innovative participatory strategies so thank you uh, once again neha to the thesis club and as you know we are also celebrating with you and it's a really privilege to celebrate with a young person about uh, you know uh, this water conversation series and thanks also for uh, sharing your uh, powerpoint presentation and we also had a good discussion before and and because i also did a phd on water governance at erasmus it really feels good that you have taken it much much ahead uh, into the governance uh, discourse and literature so you will have around uh, 25 minutes of your presentation time and then i'm going to invite our participants here with um, engaging for question and answers including there will be some questions from my end as well so over to you neha and thank you so much once again super excited thank you so much mansi uh, i will be just sharing my slide uh let me know if uh, my slide show is visible yes it's working go ahead all right so thank you so much for providing me this stage to present my work uh i am just a couple of weeks away to submit it to the external committee uh so my name is neha and i will be talking about reparation as a mode of transformation towards attaining water sensitivity in secondary cities of india 
so before going, I'll let me quickly take you through the structure of today's presentation. So I'll be explaining the uh, the problem statement of my work, uh, which is the tra transition challenges, especially in the secondary cities. Uh, then I will be taking you through my uh, framework, which I developed, uh, the governance capacities framework to enable reparation. Uh, I will then uh, showcase how I applied this framework in my field work to see how these informal capacities are at play and whether or not they enable reparation or not. And the gaps uh, which are seen in the field, how can they be strengthened for, furthermore? Uh, how can the capacities be nurtured through action research, uh, which is the uh, second part of my work? Uh, so I'll be demonstrating that by showing the results and the making of the workshop that I did in Delhi last year, and finally culminating it with the discussion. So uh, moving ahead with my research, so I start by explaining, by understanding what are the complex water challenges. And we understand in transitions discourse, we call, it, we call them persistent problems. So these are water problems which are not linear, but which are intertwined, which are intersectoral, which are interscalar, becoming it more complex and persistent. And uh, I further look at governance challenges, which you can see in which, which uh, are demonstrated in many uh, many ways, like uh, may, uh, sometimes in subconscious biases are at play. There is lack of representation. There are societal transitions that makes the challenges, the water challenges, much difficult to comprehend. And when these uh, challenges are seen in, in secondary cities, which uh, especially Indian secondary cities are very different from the rest, because the secondary cities are growing faster than the primary cities, but the infrastructure growth is not uh, at the same par as the uh, population expansion. However, there have been different reactive governance processes to meet these gaps of infrastructure demand. And therefore, we see different kinds of governance uh, taking shape in this kind of uh, cities. So, uh, but even though there are a lot of problems uh, in, uh, in water services, um, the government of India wants to think of uh, different ways of integrated water management paradigms. So even in the water policy 2012, uh, we do have ratified integrated water resource management, IWRM, but none of these integrated water management approaches have taken shape. Uh, still, we are moving ahead in thinking, can water sensitive cities, which is, I think, seventh in, in its kind, uh, the new way of looking at uh, water management in an integrated form in India. Uh, interestingly, um, this concept and this approach, which is uh, which holds a huge amount of promise, uh, it's been uh, 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 devised in Australia. And the project also looks at how do you make this possible? How do you transform it using Dutch transition management? So for me, this in, this entry point itself was quite uh, ironic because it's a very Indian problem, and we want to apply an Australian paradigm through Dutch ways of uh, change management uh, to uh, to function as a water sensitive city. So, and that for me was something necessary to look at. Uh, and furthermore, it's not just Indian problems. Uh, India also demonstrates internal colonialism. So if it's not just the colonial colonizers by the British, but then the way we take decisions, the way certain policies are made, the way certain decisions are chosen, actors are chosen, the biases, we also replicate through uh, with the same colonial uh, mindset, and I call them internal colonialism. So there is also an opportunity to decolonize our ways of management and governance uh, in order to make uh, water sensitivity work. So I use these three entry points to look at how can we see, how can we understand integrated water resource management for India, and uh, in my research, I uh, I do I challenge the transfor transformation and transition discourse of the global north, especially Europe, and I work on something called as reparation. So um, why did I decide to work on reparation and not transformation? So first thing, transformation looks at uh, overall changing of the socio-ecological uh, system. So it could be actors. So um, in governance, we look at how actors come together and make a collective decisions towards a contested resource. So for example, for water governance, we see how different stakeholders come together and work towards uh, thinking about water distributions, knowledge distributions, voice, uh, and how can all these uh, um, arrangements could be changed. However, when we think about for uh, making these transformations for country like India, 
which is already uh, very complex because of the social terrains, uh, we just can't change from you know from this particular position to a uh, to a future setting because it might perpetuate certain harm. And uh, to acknowledge that, I use the concept of reparation uh, that looks at historical harms in place, and it also tries to address those as we move ahead. Um, however, literature on repair comes in many types. So if you see technological uh, literature on repair, it talks about going back to its original, restoring it as good as new. Uh, however, I do not use that. I move. Uh, I use more social uh, sociological uh, understanding of repair, which looks at it as reparation. That concerns with healing and addressing past injustices to moving ahead. It is more as a sensibility and it's it's more long-term and community building, it's incremental. So that is the kind of transformation I'm looking at India. Um, another clue to understand what kind of reparation I'm doing, uh, since there are many Indian um, uh, participants today, uh, so I actually consulted Hindi language. And if you see, there are many words of repair. There is durust, maramat, there is rafu. So durust would be, the restorative part of repair, so going back to its original. And by doing that, uh, you do not actually change the system. However, uh, words like rafu, uh, they talk about taking the patches and, and weaving it and creating something new, uh, also recognizing the past. So that is the kind of transformation I'm looking at. And why did I also choose this is because um, the literature on uh, transformation comes heavily from the climate mitigation side of things, which, are, which has more or less tangible goals. But water climate adaptation uh, is quite ambiguous in, the, in, uh, in relation to other sectors in climate change. And because of which uh, I, I um, uh, agree with Gautam Ban's approach of taking two steps ahead, one step back, an iterative way of looking at. And also when the complex is so political and you do not know the side effects of a certain action, at that very time, it's it's better to do something and then come back, retrospect, and go ahead. So that is the form of transformation I look at, uh, which is known as reparation in my case. Uh, reparation is also scored uh, underscored by restorative justice. So um, in my research, I believe that we just not should be looking towards uh, sustainability goals. It has to be uh, intertwined with justice goals as well. And restorative justice looks at how past injustices could also be addressed while moving ahead towards sustainability goals. Um, however, so uh, once I understood like this is the kind of transformation uh, I would be looking at for Indian context, uh, but how do we mobilize this kind of reparation? Um, in India, the, the prominent mode of governance is informal governance. Um, however, uh, very old literature, and that is something we still use it, uh, uh, informality is understood as the opposite of formality, but that is not the case. I understand informality as a hybrid mode of practice. Uh, I'm going to explain very simply and avoid jargon. So imagine, you can imagine this kind of a water system which has a water reservoir and you know a, a, a water tank in the city and there is a tap and then you use it and then the the wastewater flows away. So there is a certain system which is already reinstated in, in, in any city. Uh, and there are certain actors uh, that are being uh, allocated to make to make that function uh, happen of that particular segment of a water, a water service. However, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't always go as it is because of water scarcity, because of political issues, because it's just not about the water sector. It's always land and water conflicts. There are so many issues that come into place. And at that time, people mobilize their own mandates, their, more, their own agency. Uh, they also have to work through power asymmetries to make this water system work. And this hybrid ways of engaging with uh, navigating power asymmetries, uh, also with different actors, uh, additional actors to make this entire water system work is what is informality. So it disaggregates the entire system and it co-produces new power structures or it also repairs the existing power structures to make the water system work. And that governance, that mode of governance is understood as informality. And this is the primary way of, uh, of governance in India. So I wanted to understand how can informal governance can make reparation happen. Uh, 
also governance as it's uh, on its own uh, co constitutes many things. It could be policy arrangements, it could be actors, it could be conditions, it could be many things. So for my, post, uh, for my research, I look at uh, governance capacities to understand uh, how do, I, I look at governance through an agency perspective. What does that mean? So in an agency perspective, I understand how do actors come together to make uh, to enable repair happen what are the conditions they have to navigate what are the mandates they have to uh, work through work against and work around it as well so from the agency perspective i wanted to look at how informality could be mobilized and the, another uh, advantage of working with uh, agency and capacity is also because i consider humans as not as rational beings but emotional beings and the decisions that are being taken they are also because of the, the norms in place and they are situated in, in a certain geography. So it's also important to understand the unintentionality behind certain actions to make the water system work. Well, because of and capacities framework helped me understand that as well. So moving ahead, uh, I explained the capacities framework now. So uh, for me, um, the, the informal governance constitutes two main capacities. One is consolidative capacity. So how do actors organize themselves and direct their goals to water sensitive cities? And how do they do jugad or innovate uh, within frugally within the system to make things happen? Um, there has been immense amount of literature on coordination, collaborative, integrative capacity. So what are, what are these different forms of domains of capacities that can uh, help actors to come together? And also a lot of literature on innovation, uh, collective capacity that, that talks about how people, how actors can come up with innovative solutions to make things work. However, these, again, this literature has been written in Global South for Global South geographies. And for me, uh, especially for uh, cities of Global South and India, resource constraint became a huge um, parameter to see how can these capacities be exercised, be mobilized. So uh, for integrative capacities uh, in literature in Global North talks about actors coming together and form, forming, uh, forming, forming groups. And for India, uh, this is not possible because they're already part of many different social groups. So for me, I choose this uh, concept of consolidating again from Gautam Ban's literature that, that uh, retains the distinct identity of a certain actor and, and you know, by uh, keeping that, how can they consolidate further? And uh, Jugadu would be both excavate and uh, innovate within a resource constrained uh, context and yet think of how to make things work. So uh, these are the two capacities that I look at as uh, in my framework. So they are supported by three domains. So again, in consolidative capacity, I look at how, how are how is the directionality weird? So how do actors who are anyway set in you know, their own programs in their own policy world, and how can they veer from their current action towards water sensitivity goal? I look at how is the trust rebuilt? I purposely look at rebuild than building because the uh, literature on building also talks about as if there is trust deficit. But in context like India, there is a huge, um, distrust towards the government and when there is a distrust then how can you get all actors together uh, so there has to be some kind of healing and mending of relationships uh, which is primary and then only the groups can, can come together and, and work together so the second domain was about rebuilding trust and third is establishing middle ground to help work on um, you know explanation translation of goals uh, getting different actors on the same page. So these kind of aspects. So how do these three domains come together and, and make consolidative capacity happen? Uh, for Jugadu, I look at how knowledge is pluralized, especially water sector in India is just not only scientific technological, but it's also cultural. Uh, and these many different versions and aspects of water can be understood and be carried forward in decision making. Uh, what are these different spaces to identify opportunities, opportunities and not just urban planning? And also the new innovations and the exnovations, how can these, uh, this could be embedded in the institutional circles? Um, also, these two capacities do not function isolated in an isolated manner, but it's a synergistic framework. 
uh, and this also helps informality uh, to work in a repair sense. What do I mean by that is there's also literature, uh, we also know informality can also lead to corruption. It can lead to unaccountability. Uh, however, when informality is mobilized towards reparation, uh, it works as a moral compass. It helps to guide light to see how can informality actually work towards uh, addressing historic injustices and uh, lead towards more equitable water access. Um, yeah. So um, moving ahead, let me explain the case that I worked on. Uh, so first, uh, my PhD was part of a project. It was called Water for Change. It's an Indo-Dutch project. Um, and then uh, both these um, funding organizations, they work through research organizations in both the countries through PhDs. So I'm based in Netherlands, uh, in Drift, and I work on governance. Uh, I chose to look at Bhopal and Bhuj. Uh, the reason being they have both distinct uh, water climates. So, for example, Bhuj is arid, and uh, and Bhopal is is it's it's I I don't want to say is uh, sufficient. There is no there are no water issues, but I want to say uh, through my uh, through my field work, I came to know that it it has perceived water sufficiency. So, what does that mean? Um, I wanted to explain as a comparative manner. So, for example, in Bhuj, uh, we see that uh, the Bhuj city gets its water from Narmada, and it travels across 700 kilometers. It it comes to the uh, the border city, and then it is pumped to Bhuj. Uh, it is then circulated around through lakes. Uh, the the issues that we see in Bhuj is hypersalinity and water scarcity. So, what happens is um, many times pe uh, people forget that there used to be uh, an entire aquifer that would actually sustain the city before, but once the Narmada water came in, the dependency of the city on its aquifer started reducing, and because of which over extraction happened and the salinity further increased. Um, and because the city, because Bhut city is so far away from Narmada, the origin which is in Madhya Pradesh, uh, sometimes there, there are many technical glitches and that also affects the water distribution. Um, similarly, in Bhopal, uh, Bho uh, interestingly, Bhopal has Narmada, has many water sources, but it is not in the city limits, it is outside. Um, and Bhopal is understood as city of lakes, but in my uh, field, I saw that uh, the city is turning and becoming more and more dependent on Narmada. And the water, uh, the lakes are being used for recreational purposes and for wastewater management. Uh, in, in my fieldwork, I also saw the Union Carbide plant, uh, which met with an accident in 1984. Uh, before that, for 20 years, the persistent organic pollutants from the plant were also leaked into the aquifer, which has caused an irreversible damage. And because of which uh, the water bodies around it are not fit to be used and it's further uh, spreading also in the city. Uh, these things are not yet been acknowledged in that way and we do not see that being reflecting in the water management measures as well. And for me, this is also as important problem of not recognizing issues or not having a sense of urgency towards issues. So uh, prioritizing of certain problems and this political interference in prioritization of problems uh, is are some of the issues that I see in Bhopal. Uh, in Bhuj and Bhopal, we, uh, I saw a lot of NGOs, CSOs, uh, local actors in play. But because Bhuj has also other uh, disasters such as earthquakes and floods, they are much, uh, the, uh, the other stakeholders are much better coordinated. However, Bhuj is very uh, sporadic in its uh, community-led efforts. Um, so how do I apply the framework to see uh, if the if efforts are been leading towards reparation or not? Uh, so I used this method called as visual ethnography and I created something called as routines using a camera. Um, this paper is getting published by the end of this year. So because um, I had to understand why people take certain decisions, why certain practices are in place. And it is not just by talking to people. It's also by a talking for a longer duration, walking with them, uh, imitating certain things, uh, observing their 
uh, actions and then uh, asking for clarifications. Uh, many times also looking through the camera lens helped me see certain things which I would miss out in a naked eye. Um, you know, like if someone, someone sits on the ground and I would sit with them and then I would understand certain, um, you know, like the connection to the, to, to the question in, in place. So uh, I, I managed to do this more sensorially to understand how people are connected to their uh, water questions in place. Um, so these are the five routines I worked through. Uh, also, something like something that would just get go missing, you know, in in a, in a normal site. So that's where uh, digital photography helped me understand how decisions are being made. Um, so, for example, um, on the left, uh, you see the two. Uh, they are actually municipal employees who are water super, uh, water tank supervisors. And their job is to release water uh, at a stipulated time to a certain neighborhood. And the, the timings and the quantity of water is all uh, is always pre-decided. However, this, this, this thing happened in Butch, uh, the water is scarce. And then the distribution becomes a political challenge. So if there is an elected uh, member staying in that particular neighborhood, he would also call the supervisor, threaten him, or send gifts. So there are different ways of doing so uh, when I was there, I could see, I saw one resident just coming in pleading for water and he just said, okay, I'll just, I will just release the wall and you will get the water. So it, so a lot of these decisions happens through interpersonal relationships. Sometimes um, many, actually all the supervisors I met, they were just, um, they, they represented more people than the government because they had to be accepted by the people because whenever there are leakages and there are any repairing that has to happen, uh, his workers generally get beaten up or, you know, people are always angry at him. So uh, so that the supervisors are more accepted by the public, he has to do this kind of uh, favors of uh, all releasing water whenever they're asking. So even though there is a, a, a receipt book where, you know, a formal register where uh, it states how, when and how the water was released, uh, it's, it doesn't actually represent the real situation on, in hand. Similarly, this was a mural in front of uh, Bhopal's um, in, uh, main lake, the upper lake. But you see, uh, it's actually Narmada, uh, the, the picture of uh, yeah, the abstract visual of Narmada, which has been celebrated. And also, like in India, uh, rivers are being venerated as mothers, and lakes are generally, they have a, a masculine touch to it. So um, it also made a huge amount of impact when people started to take pride in saying, you know, in my house, we have Narmada's connection. And uh, so that also played a role in, uh, we need to make Bhopal connected to Narmada instead of saying, we need to make Bhopal water resilient within its uh, water bodies uh, in the city limits. So these kind of narratives and this kind of connection to the water also makes a difference when water decisions are being taken. So um, I don't want to go in detail, but uh, I'll just explain in Bhuj uh, how I saw consolidative capacity at play. So because there were many NGOs and they're connected to uh, universities in Ahmedabad and Rajkot, uh, we did see a lot of scientific knowledge also being used. Uh, but very, more interestingly, there were activities such as water walks or uh, there were actors who work with the represent with the residents and they use their experiential knowledge. So whenever I would speak with people, they would always say, so 10 years back or 15 years back or during my mother, the water was this way, this was the salinity. So they use their experiences to make, to disseminate knowledge, to make people uh, more aware of the water issues. The, the mediation is in, uh, is highly, uh, con uh, is considered a very important role in water management in uh, Butch. Uh, because of uh, the translation of certain kind of knowledge to the residents and back. Um, also, there is a uh, there are a lot of different programs, such as with the army, such as with the schools. Uh, they work towards rebuilding trust so that the people are part of the decision making processes. So even uh, Bhuj has municipal council and not municipal corporation because of the population size. Uh, they still are working towards ward com uh, committees, uh, which are uh, which are the committees at a local for, to make local governance work. Uh, 
it is not yet mandated. However, the NGOs are helping them to, to set up these kind of uh, uh, governance bodies to make decisions happen. And again, so these are informal ways of doing, but then there, there, are, there is presence of a municipal uh, officer, uh, elected member, or sometimes the mayor also comes in to give it a sense of authority to these decisions. Um, but what we also saw in Bhoja is, although these local governance acts were happening very well, uh, there was still a, a parallel national level uh, work happening, which is about in, river interlinking or uh, creating more artificial water reservoirs uh, to address the scarcity, which, are, which is not a long-term solution. So when these two parallel acts are happening, uh, the, the, the priority would always go to the, the national government's uh, uh, work. And because of which we did not see practices on undoing and exnovation, which made uh, it like, you know, on the side, if, if there is time and money, then the activities of the NGOs can happen. Uh, and this, this is the reason, and reason why, it, since it was not supported by the government, there, was a, there were chances of these cohesive ways of working to be fizzling out over time. Uh, and if there's no sense of urgency, it wouldn't happen all the time. Uh, also for Jugadu subcapacity, uh, as I said earlier, um, is, Abuj is very rich in its water heritage with its bow and uh, all kinds of artifacts and people take pride in it. So water conservation has become a, into a practice. Uh, there's a very interesting ritual. So uh, whenever it rains and the main lake, uh, Hamir Sar Lake, when it fills out, it, uh, the mayor declares it as a national, uh, as, a, as a city holiday. And that because of which the, the filling of, of the reservoir becomes an important thing to do. So, so there is a great uh, uh, mixing of blending of these different values of water system. Uh, also, these uh, practices which are being carried out by uh, the NGOs, they also are represented there. They go to different international conferences to present. So, Bhuj is one of the most widely studied cities in India, in India on their water conservation efforts. Uh, however, again, uh, it's not everyone. It's also certain NGOs now. Um, yeah, all the NGOs, again, uh, there are new NGOs which are coming up, but they are not connected to the original circle of NGOs. And um, many times, as I said, uh, the government believes in ha having um, uh, concrete uh, artificial reservoirs to, you know, to meet with the uh, growing demand of water. And because of which the long-term efforts taken, uh, to be taken to uh, uh, work, work on the aquifer restoration, uh, that gets delayed and it, it, it gets uh, still, it's further gets uh, not prioritized. So, yeah, so this is not getting uh, worked out better, and and that's the that's the thing that I saw in Bhuj. So from the field, uh, when I saw finally how uh, did it uh, uh, did it attain reparation? So to a certain limit. So how did uh, a reparation look like? So first thing is in both the cities, I did see water challenges to be seen through multifaceted lens. So it's not just technology and it's not just water drinking and, and sanitation, but there is also historical value. There is also cultural value to water. Um, we, I also saw uh, the different ways to which power structures uh, were more and more getting decentralized. There are more local structures being formulated, being strengthened uh, through the informal governance. Uh, I did see a lot of decisions being taken out of care, out of altruism. Uh, because of the sense of urgency towards the situation. And there was also routinizing of those new innovations, so such, as, such as in Bhuj, the school principals have come together to set up new uh, rainwater harvesting structures and so that the water sensitive behavior could be, could be cultivated uh, within the school curriculum. And there is no time and uh, it would be too time consuming to change the central uh, educational curriculum uh, instead after after school hours, the school teachers themselves teach uh, students uh, a separate curriculum on water. So these are the things that happened. However, I did see that again these informality provides an uh, a space for, for uh, you know experimenting, creating, uh, 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 thinking of new ways of doing things. However, if it is not supported by formal structure, if this it's if it's not upscaled. Uh, also, there is no credibility to the actions also. So 
there has to, as i said earlier informality works through hybrid forms of governance so if if the if it, if it is not taken ahead so then these uh, uh, efforts has this tendency of fizzling out uh, so un by, after understanding the gaps of, of practice i looked at how can we make it how can we strengthen it more and that was something this project was working towards and it looked at transition management as the mode to build capacities. Uh, so that was the word, build capacities uh, within the different actors at play. Uh, however, through my re repair logic, I sense that um, all these projects and programs which are funded by uh, foreign funds, and when they come, they come as if, you know, with the white savior ideology, uh, like get people, make them think, dream, and then uh, we'll help them design ideas. So that's not how it is. So through reparation, I realized that people are already working on something and they're stuck at something. So how can we find solutions, address those, and though and that can lead to uh, sensitivity. So for example, uh, we uh, gathered uh, the actors um, uh, and thought of what are the questions, what are the problems they're working towards. So at this step, the many experts, they thought the uh, the questions, the problems they were working were the questions. However, I use we use this, uh, uh, I don't know if you are aware of the story of six blind men and the elephant, where each a blind person think, thinks that uh, the, how the elephant is by their own touch. So that's what we did. So earlier, the, the problems stated by each actor were more like symptoms. And when all these symptoms came together and they realized, oh, but the problem is something else. It is maybe beyond their domain. So we formulated a problem tree. And then we worked on repairing a vision. And I say repairing because um, in all the three cities, there are actors who are already working on so many projects through Umbru, through smart cities, through municipalities, development plans. So there are already programs in, in processes. So what we did is we asked the actors to state their visions and we saw if those visions are complementary or not. And if they are, are they then reaching towards sensitivity or not? So how can the current efforts be you know, re, uh, redirected towards sensitivity efforts. Uh, also, the second thing that we work towards is adding how to the vision. So one problem that I saw in the way people do visioning is just working towards what? So to give you an example, uh, if my goal is to reduce weight, so that's the what part. But then if you if if my intention of reducing weight is to uh, mitigate diabetes, is to not is to prevent having diabetes, then the approach towards reducing weight becomes different. And if my uh, if my vision is to reduce weight because I already have diabetes, then my approach is also different. And then the steps and the strategies to reduce weight would be different. And therefore, the vision it needs to have that how part is because to mitigate or to prevent is is it the preventive action or is it the uh, adaptive action? That's also how climate mitigation and climate adaptation works. And that nuance should be there in the visions and that's what we did in you know, when we say repair, uh, repairing of the visions and then uh, in workshop three and four that's where i specifically worked into my phd was uh, so in in dutch transition management this step would be basically to design pathways and i would i worked uh, i decided to create a kind of a space of engaging with experts and peers from other cities so we call stakeholders from these three cities, Bhopal, Bhuj, and Kozipur, to come to Delhi and speak to experts to understand why, how can those pathways be made? And on the second day, uh, how can these three city stakeholders can speak to each other and can design pathways? It sounds easy, but it wasn't. So my uh, I use the reparation and informality frameworks, uh, mostly informality, to design platforms. So in India, Having participatory and consultations in through a workshop mode is not new, but we all know like these workshops are generally used for networking, discussing ideas and going back. And many times I have been part of these uh, before my work in the uh, Water for Change. And many times people just laugh at thinking it's just, it's too ambitious, things don't happen. Yeah, so, uh, so my role here was to design safe enough spaces. And I, through my research, through my field work, I also realized Talking about transformation entails ex, uh, acknowledging and accepting limitations, incompetencies. And in countries like India, where there is competition, there is job insecurity, 
people can't take those risks. You cannot just say say uh, uh, things out. Uh, you cannot call out your seniors to talk about uh, challenges in water governance, certain decisions which are being made. Uh, also, water management is highly technocratic. It is very engineering centric. So it's a, there's a huge biases. So engineers also feel like they cannot come across as something someone who do not understand many things. And water management is not just engineering. It is also so many other sectors. So this becomes a huge individual and political issue. Then how do we design spaces where people are okay to talk about their own limitations? So I designed two ways of doing this. Um, it was through food fair and it was uh, as a, a classroom without teachers. So when I talk about food fairs, uh, what I did is um, I uh, identified themes of issues that were uh, recognized during the problem tree. I invited national experts and they were seated on every snack. So it was 4 p.m. It was a snack time in India. We have chai time. Uh, so the and then each stakeholder uh, with one or two other stakeholders would go to the expert and start talking. So, for example, what happened interestingly was uh, uh, in the first go to actors were obviously technological like engineers who were designing models and how can these models be implemented in, say, Bhopal's uh, municipality or Bhuj's municipality. So the conversation started, OK, what is your model and how can we implement it? And then slowly it went to permissions uh you know how how did you manage it how did you get funding so the question slowly became into how showing and talking about the issues in the system and none of these uh, discussions were recorded we tried to see that the water for change people are also not there it's just the experts and the people uh later on i did a one-on-one -on -one follow up interviews without names taken like you know what were the kind of issues which were discussed to understand how it finally penetrated to discussing governance challenges. Uh, and on the second day, um, so before going there, uh, again, this session was not 100% uh, successful because uh, if you see, only young stakeholders went and discussed with the experts. A lot of older stakeholders felt it was beneath them to be talking to young experts and they knew better. And that's how ageism works in Indian governance. So instead of addressing, we decided to navigate it. That's okay. So when the young stakeholders went and spoke to the experts, they collected the ideas, came back on the table, and dis discussed it with the older stakeholders. So till those ideas are being circulated, it's okay. Uh, in the second day, uh, when the experts left, it was only uh, stakeholders of the three cities. So what we did is we asked the senior stakeholders to go to the tables of the other cities and speak to the junior stakeholders and discuss how they solve certain ideas. So for example, uh, uh, Cozy Code was looking at Boots, uh, Bhopal's uh, Lake Development uh, Authority and how that was, uh, uh, was, was formulated. So when any senior actor would say, we did this, we addressed this problem, he would also have to say, what was the problem? And that would mean they had to accept a certain issue but then it would come across as how that certain actor addressed that problem. And, and that created that space of uh, celebrating um, issues and failures and then finding a solution. The major thing that came from this workshop was the solutions became feasible. And there was a sense of uh, this belief that, hey, this water sensitivity can be done. Uh, and this is what we think is water sensitivity. Also, it was not about integrated water management. It was more so about synergistic water management. So it was more about, yes, we work in silos, but we'll see to it that these domains can still work together. Can we create inroads? Can we create systems where different departments, different actors can still work with together, but we are not creating a new system altogether, which is more expensive and difficult to implement. So these are this is how the feasibility of things uh, was uh, was ex was mobilized in these workshops so the main things that came sorry. up sorry neha sorry yes. i will interrupt but you may have to please uh, wind up as yeah, soon as it's, possible it's, it's okay. the ending so what we saw okay. is uh, okay. uh, the yeah. workshops normalized discussions on uh, governance it promoted an iterative way of doing and it again fostered personal relationships and networks but again without uh, without authority which happened only in cozy the mayor was present so now 
the uh, the outputs are actually getting implemented uh, but in uh, uh, other cities there weren't that authoritative uh, presence and so then it just remains as is um so yeah in the entire research i found um reparation uh, which was enabled through informality through four aspects of how water challenges were th seen through multifaceted lenses how the traditional power hierarchies are been contested uh, how networks of care now were enabled so it's not just mandates you do you just don't need mandates to make work happen make water management happen but also through networks of care which is actually the prime need at this point and how their new improvisation so instead of talking of innovations and explorations it was more towards how do we routinize uh, improvisation so in my research i finally want to end so there was a, a, i did see a certain logic a certain extent to which uh, informality could become reparative however it does need support of formality to make things work but then there is a future scope to understand how this could be further ingrained in everyday governance practices thank you thank you so much aneha sorry to intervene in between but uh, because we have to have really good discussion on these uh, important research presentations and really uh, very uh, deep in uh, introspection also one has to make when uh, people look at your water governance approach of uh, looking at the informality and i learned a lot of new words today so that's also something major uh, take away for me uh, so I will see if there are any questions in the chat box at present. I just hear uh, Peter Molinga left, uh, so uh, it's it's a pity. But I, I will start with my questions and I request uh, participants who are present here to either pose their questions in the chat box. And uh, at the same time, if you think, no, you would just like to speak up, uh, please raise your hand. And meanwhile, I can ask my questions to Neha. So uh, Neha, I'm, I also did my water uh, governance research at the same university, just a floor above you in, in the tea building at Erasmus. So good to see you are uh, looking at governance from a very different perspective because uh, 15 years ago when I was on the field uh, talking about governance here in India, in uh, at four different cities and Bhopal we have common, uh, I, I, I kind of uh, got a feeling both from the people and from, uh, you know, from uh, the government itself is that the governance is by the government, you know. So in, in that context, um, you, you so beautifully lay out the details or nuances of the informality that within that formal setup, there are a lot of things that happen just uh, um, uh, just happens, you know, through the informality and giving the example of Bhuj supervisor. Uh, was uh, was a very good way to understand what what it means when a person comes and when they interact at a very uh, individual level and the fact that supervisor belongs to that community or the people's per person uh, you know and enriches that informality or probably uh, it makes informality function so <clears throat> but when we look at governance by definition and you are sitting at the hub of governance uh, scholarship with uh, Tysman and uh, you know Alan Bose all sitting there uh, governance by definition was democratic somewhere uh, when we translated and we look at the literature in india we look at it in very different way um, uh, would you please uh, tell us where is that informality scholarship uh, placed in the governance in, in India at this point in time? Uh, because in scholarship it is not there, but in practice it is there. So how, how do you uh, find your, your research positioning this whole idea of informality into the governance? Because in practice we are already doing it. It's just the scholarship part of it. Yeah, uh, no, thank you for this very important question. Uh, and you rightly said um, about misunderstandings of governance, which is also uh, used very interchangeably by work done by government or governance is also considered as administration. So first, let me be clear, like yeah. for me, governance is intentional decisions being taken by actors over social actions. And when I, and when we I see this in water, I use uh, Zwartivin's uh, definition which is uh, actors coming together to make decisions on contested water distributions. And distribution does not only mean physical water, it would mean knowledge distributions and also voice distribution. So how do actors come together and think about this? 
um so and then the third layer that i'm looking at is transformative so how do yes. these actors uh, could also change could also be introduced could be uh, to make to think about water uh, more differently because the, the water problems have been changing um so when you see governance uh, structures how do people come how do different organization entities come together there are formal mechanisms in place to make this decision making happen however this formal mechanisms unfortunately are very rigid uh, they're not generally they do not generally include everyone or um the original way of water governance is also very connected to experts and these experts are again coming from engineering and uh, the technological side of things and there is less space for non expert or marg or i would say in, in other marginalized voices so where are the consumers why why are in their voices in say and when we say democratic so is that democratic enough are the current arrangements democratic enough and they are not and because they are not we see these developments and these plans failing uh, and therefore uh, even though we uh, we want it to be changed the changing process is also time consuming it is expensive and that's where uh, uh, malini ranganathan talks ab uh, talks about informality as tentacles to formality and they that's why it works together so certain spaces are created and uh, again informality is not unregulated spaces it's, it's more deregulated there uh, there is a uh, loosening or you know stopping of certain norms and then you include certain actors hear them out work with them create this places and and that's how inform informal actor informal governance works so uh, yeah so therefore that's how i see informality and interestingly as a indian uh, working in uh, netherlands um when i started this research it was looked upon like oh an exotic research this is how informality how poor countries manage but in reality for me informal governance is more humane governance because generally people think as if there are mandates and there are structures in place and cities and people function like that no it's not like that needs arise you call you email there is a sense of urgency and and that's how decisions are been taken and now uh, i'm very happy to say that you know so informality people whenever i present this in this part of the world people also recognize oh this is how decisions are also taken here informality is present everywhere maybe in different ways and different practices but yeah interesting because you uh, you also um, put up a very interesting point when you talk about moving from integrated approach to more synergistic approach and uh, you i i'm trying to link it uh, where, because you say it towards the end of your presentation but initially you also talk about how internally we are colonized and uh, and giving example of integrated water resource management and then the dutch transition management and then you try to uh, you know go beyond and talk about reparation in your in your presentation and when i and when i look at your idea of reparation it it is quite interesting because you also make a difference between repair and reparation where uh, the, i think the uh, the touch or uh, the healing or uh, touch or making amends with nimbler innovations as you use the word and that's why i'm saying i'm quite uh, you know uh, intrigued by the way you are talking about these uh, very uh, you know very uh, present in our system but at the same time uh, we take it for granted it's just like you know uh, you give the example of doing rafu or pico and uh, which is you know uh, using the local language or uh, things like that so i mean if if we look at the whole idea of repairing and especially when you talk about its uh, healing and uh, adjustments and and you also link it with justice you know so i i'm just uh, trying to understand if we want to achieve this justice goals especially when we talk about water water ethics and justice are uh, you uh, are you, you see reparation as a as a way to go ahead with it and and you also found out in your examples that it is happening and you uh, you also mentioned that uh, no but reparation alone uh, is not, isn't enough as you present towards the end uh, there is certain level of you know marriage of the formality and informality is required of course uh, the percentage of each is uh, a different discussion altogether but where do you see uh, the uh, the two of this uh, you know consolidative capacity and jugaadu capacity uh, can be really uh, 
modeled uh, apart from Bhuj and Bhopal, which are very good examples to work out. Can we really uh, arrive at some kind of situation where we study cases and we can really eventually quantify, you know, in this kind of setup, the consolidative capacity, and I'm, I'm assuming it more from the uh, formal way of doing things and then having, uh, you know, the Jugaru approach, more informal way of doing it and kind of finding a marriage. Can we really eventually, probably I'm already hinting you, maybe you start thinking about it for your postdoc <laughs> or, oh, uh, or, a, or a professor. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you for this. So first thing is my study is very qualitative where I look at how yeah. people engage and uh, how do those engagement lead to certain uh, new ways of doing or, mm -hmm. or reestablishing the old ways of doing. So if you are asking for evaluation of capacity, so first one of the learnings from my work was I in my research, if you see towards the end, I say workshops help to strengthen and nurture capacity. So that actually changes. So whenever we have these Amrut and smart city workshops happening, uh, the key is not to build capacities. Then that is a very new, uh, new colonial way of looking at uh, approach. Like we have money and we are here to build your capacities. No, uh, first thing, the first change is you can go and assess the capacities at, at place. And then how can that be strengthened? How can you make people acknowledge their own uh, capacities and they could be mobilized exercise to better way. So uh, if you ask me how to evaluate, so for, for me, understanding existing coalitions and how can those coalitions be used for better. So uh, whenever we talk about, so what are the water networks in a city? What are the water groups working? Instead, uh, in Bhuj, we saw school groups being there. We saw uh, peop, uh, women's uh, Mahela group also were working towards water goals. So they use the existing groups and work towards water goals. So how do you uh, veer their personal goals towards water goals and you intertwine those goals? So yeah, so those for me were evaluation and even quantitatively you can see so we do not need more water groups. So integrated water resource management, all these paradigms talks about new water user associations being set up, new RBOs, river basin organizations, which again takes money and you know mixing and match matching of new groups. Instead, how can we repurpose existing groups? And that for me is evaluating existing uh, coalitions. And again, and second part was instead of uh, listing out new innovations, we could see improvisations in the existing work. So how can certain uh, uh, existing structure could be repurposed in a certain way? How can uh, heritage water walks can be used to create a sense of awareness that rather than starting something new? So those would be uh, the way to actually tangibly uh, understand the efforts which have been taken. Yeah, interesting because you also made this point uh, during your presentation, these large mega projects come with huge dreams and huge money. And then these small uh, things or initiatives which are happening locally, they kind of overshadowed in, uh, but if there can be interweaving happening, and I think this is where reparation and the way informality you are looking at can be a good way to even implement the larger projects or attain more success in the larger projects, you know, if they have to be reaching the last mile. But Anyway, I'll stop here and take uh, Paresh, uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. And then I see there's a question posed to me uh, personally. So maybe that can, yes, Sonali also, please Sonali after Paresh. Okay, go ahead, Paresh. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, giving so... Paresh chance before Sonali, sorry, because Paresh just mentioned about a child in the house. So he should get the chance first. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, Neha, very interesting work and, and kudos uh, uh, to your work, uh, I sense, and I'm not sure if I if I will be able to point it out correctly, but or if I'm putting it right, but I sense a mix of your feelings towards political processes. On one side, you think planning to be a deep political or very expert led process, uh, where and I and specifically I was the term that I was uh, think that brought it out to me was the political interference. And on the other hand, you provide examples of it being very, very, very political. Uh, your, I mean, the uh, political bosses calling up the, uh, you know, uh, valve men to uh, open up uh, uh, supply of water. Uh, again, the relationships between the networks or actors is also, uh, in a sense, political uh, relationship. So how do you, I was curious to know, how do you see 
politics uh, play out or what are your views on the politics of water thank you no uh, thank you so much so for me uh, i did not i don't think so i said depolitize so for water governance itself is a political process because it looks at different actors at play and yeah. navigating through various power asymmetries so it is political uh, what i was trying to say is this political asymmetries interferences uh, impositions need to be considered and acknowledged because uh, the current discourses do not even consider this or this is so when I used to have this uh, uh, interviews, it's like, yeah, but this happens. But yes, but that is important to be considered in the research. Uh, uh, taking decisions out of uh, altruistic logic or because that person was threatened has to be considered. We need to acknowledge this in order to create uh, better decision-making platforms. Uh, yeah, so that is what I meant. And yes, uh, that is the starting point. I mean, water governance itself is... Uh, political exactly. and it cannot be uh, reduced to an uh, or depoliticized because uh, yeah so and then it would be highly technocratic as if it moves through a point A to point B by turning certain walls no it is it is it is only political that's what I would say. Perfect. You know, I, I mean, uh, thanks, Paresh. I would like to add here what Paresh was asking, in fact, and uh, uh, responding on your behalf, also adding to your response, Neha, that I think the fact that uh, we consider politics as out of the system itself uh, needs to be embedded now. And uh, in, in th through your work, I find that there is more room for informality and reparation because pol actually in political setup, all these things are much stronger presence, but we, we kind of, uh, we tend to uh, shy away from studying those systems, probably with our limitation of disciplines, but I'm sure there are people from political science who are studying these nuances. And uh, I mean, I don't know if somebody is uh, from that background doing a PhD in this kind of topic, but I think in politics, Whatever you were talking about through uh, the, the informal process, the whole deliberation, these things are already happening, whether it is during election time or whether it is uh, in the parliamentary affairs, a lot of these things happen within the party, between the parties, you know. So there is a room, uh, but we have to focus in the water sector. So may I invite uh, Sonali Upasani? I hope I have pronounced your name correctly. I take your question first, and then if time permits, we'll take uh, one or two questions more. Go ahead, Sonali. Please unmute yourself and uh, Neha, you can read the question also in the chat box. Huh? Do you see it? Because I see Sonali is uh, not unmuting herself. So maybe you can just, or shall I read it for you? Uh, yeah, uh, you can. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I have one question that when cities are increasing the FSI by starting the limited infrastructure such as water supply sources, waste management, how can such ideas play a role in creating a planned development to ensure equitable distribution of resources? Uh, thank you for this. Um, I want to tell you with my experience in Bhopal. Uh, so whenever decisions on water supply are being taken, uh, it is uh, mainly through irrigation department, which is center. Water, it is not state or city, it is uh, central government. And the central government takes this uh, irrigation department takes decision like uh, once the rain rainfall is done uh, is how the rainy season is over uh, then they see how much rain has been happening which water reservoirs are filled filled in the state level and then is it enough for the city's consumption to happen and then they decide on uh, what can the agriculture uh, how can they what can be done or what should the farmers be growing with the uh, leftover water so this is how decisions are being taken. So now you see which actors are in play and who has more power and whose voice has more weightage. And this needs to be changed. Like, why is it that? Why is center government deciding this, this much rain and this much consumption? Instead, why do we not work through demand management? Why do we not work from the local, then go to the higher? And this, this processes of coming together and creating decision-making can change. And that is something that we see that we saw in Kerala through uh, works through uh, NGOs like Kudumbashri, who are not water per se, water NGOs, but they they connect people, they they keep their networks uh, in check, and then the local governances are very strong. Uh, also, something like Netherlands, people are very much aware of water disasters that can happen. People are aware of water issues, so they themselves work towards 
conservation efforts they themselves work towards knowing where the water is coming from in buj there is something called as water walk where uh, residents are taken to know where does that water rain water falls and how how much what is the distance of it to come to your house and then they make them reflect on the 700 kilometer journey and then they realize this is unsustainable and we need to conserve more so now the residents are demanding to come and they want to be part of the decision making processes hence ward sabhas and all these different local governance structures are getting formulated so that's where the contestation between the local and the central level decision making is happening and that's where we need to change this uh, governance structure and that's where i talk about repair which also talks about uh, bringing in the marginalized voices which are the consumers why aren't residents coming and saying hey why aren't we part of the decision making processes why aren't we talking if why aren't buj people bhopal people coming and saying hey why aren't lakes being part of the pro in the water management designs why it's only narmada uh, and when these questions are brought up so uh, it was a deliberate attempt to not have the victims who consumed the polluted water because of the uh, le uh, leakage of union carbide so if they would have been part of this decision making processes the questions would change the planning uh, the the visions the vision statements would change right and that would lead to different plans so uh, this is where repair takes place and again it's not just experts yes experts are needed but you also need different experts you also need different actors also at different levels and that is what reparation entails to do so it helps you look at water diff through different lenses and again not just technological way but also through spiritual way and right now buj wants to work on water conservation because it is a matter of pride and that supersedes more uh, than just looking at through uh, like a consumerist uh, through a consumerist lens so that also creates a sense of belonging for people to be more motivated to be part of the decision making processes and that is more sustainable than just pushing it as a work of the government to make sure that we get water in our taps so that is the change which is required at the moment especially when water question is becoming more and more severe interesting uh, I, I i have a question probably we'll put it as a last question as well uh, because uh, the, this question needs to be asked you are sitting at drift uh, which has pioneered in uh, the literature on transformation and transition and here you go and uh, really challenge it especially looking at the global north and global south and uh, you are nurturing the idea of reparation you know and uh, i'm sure they are taking it uh, with a lot of open uh, you know thoughts and also seeing if it can take uh, further scholarship in in the same department uh, my question to you is both in the scholarship sense and also in the practical sense uh, the, the challenge of you know embracing informality into uh, go governance i had asked it in different way initially and how to leverage it in uh, in terms of evaluation i had asked but how to really look at the challenges of informality or even of uh, you know strength of the informality to leverage in in the formalization or you can see the question in a different way as well how to leverage uh, you know formal institutions to embrace a bit of informality and i'm, I'm sure drift will take it further in other other commons and other public goods as well in research in future so uh, uh so thank you for this so i have uh, in my research i have shown how i have uh, operationalized informality as well so uh, it's it's not like it's again it's opposite uh, so even in the in workshops you see coffee chatter happening you know things happening on the side so through i'm actually trying to acknowledge hey this is this happens and this is relevant that's and we need to consider and not ignore it anymore because that's mm. where real decisions are being taken alongside the things that are happening even in uh, the given time and space uh, even for even in the fields it's not just the mandates and how people function in office time but how people also take decisions out of care thread and these yeah. have to be considered so it's more about yeah. acknowledging than happening as a side thing which is inappropriate uh, but again going through reparation it also sees that it is towards the the sensitivity goals and not just uh, as a quick fix or just as a corrupt practices to you know uh, give it give the water to people who are you know providing more money or something so that yeah. is not uh, it's not perpetuating injustices 
so is it towards sensitivity if people are aligned towards sensitivity goal then you actually use personal uh, connections to yeah you the water leak. yeah because in in india we know that there's a lot of water leakage but not necessarily just because of technological error but many mm -hmm. people do not have uh, land certificates and they therefore they are not assigned they are not allowed to get tap connections but in that way the leakage is actually making water available so mm -hmm. uh so it's actually more equitable to have leakages in that way uh sorry this is very uh, uh, maybe a wrong statement to make but yeah, then it's but uh, that's that why we do not have to see it only through black and white but what does yeah. informality really is it do it's doing it's it's actually helping um, situations but again uh, i am aware and cognizant about its malpractices and that's where reparation through restorative justice provides a kind of a moral compass of how do these informal activities can lead to a better prospect than uh, perpetuating injustice you know the way you have presented uh, the reparation and particularly talking about the informality i i kind of feel uh, the way our culture is uh, uh, in india informality is just like omnipresent you know just like sun moon water you know it's there i mean now it's matter of whether we take it for granted and in your research you are saying no we can actually document it and and in leverage it uh, to uh, make it more water sensitive community and cities which is very close to what uh, the sdg goal is talking about in 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 real sense when we talk, look at uh, the sdg so i think that's a, a, a good time we can also call it off for today because we have crossed the time limit as well but i hope you enjoyed this conversation and i also hope that uh, this will act as a good preparation for your defense uh, soon to come so first of all um, thank you so much for coming and also uh, best wishes for your submission as well as defense date and i hand it over to ekta to do the vote of thanks and announcement for future thank you ekta over to you thank you mansi it was really a wonderful session and uh, very meaningful discussion so it's time to uh, say thank you to everybody to all who have joined us and who are watching us online and who will be watching us the recorded sessions thank you neha for presenting your presentation here so now it's time to announce the uh, our upcoming sessions in the forthcoming wednesday for water session on 16th of october 2024 at 7:30 am canada time do join for Asia series discussion on mapping urgency for deploying stormwater management programs. The joining link is in the chat box. For more info, visit us at www.w4w.in. Please circulate the link so that um, more and more people can join and uh, enjoy the conversation and the learning process. We shall continue the Friday Water Thesis Club and other Friday Water sessions. We shall also continue with Monday munching. Musing with women for water. If you know interested speakers, do connect with us. For more details, check the chat box as well as visit us at www.w4w.in. Thank you. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Ekdan. Thanks, Neha. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thanks. Um, sure. You are on mute, Neha. Just in just that you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. bye. bye.